Welcome to another episode of a Quick Timeout Podcast presented by Dr. Dish Basketball. This is a day that I've actually been looking forward to for over two years. I didn't tell him this at the beginning because I didn't want to put pressure on him. But when I started the podcast, I, I had a handful of coaches that was like, I want to have them on the show someday. And Coach Mike Neighbors was one of those guys. And today is the day. So I'm super. Coach, thanks so much for making part of all of that come true. Of course, I'm disappointed it took two years if I was so high on this priority list. I, I wanted to be in one of those early episodes, but I, I'm glad glad you let me let it get started and work out the kinks. And uh, that's right. It's a that's pleasure right. and an honor to be on be on here with you to talk hoops. That's for I, sure. I had to get things rolling and make sure that I knew what I was talking about and whatnot. Uh, I think you got that covered. All right, all right. So we're going to talk today. Transition offense is is where we're kind of going to spend most of our time. Yep. Um, I've said this before jokingly, I do these interviews somewhat selfishly because we run what Coach Neighbors does there at Arkansas, not as well, but we have stolen a lot, let me put it that way, a lot of what Coach Neighbors does there at Arkansas. And I know others, the joke is with coaches when they're introductory press conferences, everybody's going to play fast. Yep. Coach Neighbors actually does play fast. <laughs> before I get to that, for those who don't know, Coach, you tell me what it means to play functionally fast. Uh, getting a quick shot without ever turning it over. You know, for us to consistently still lead the country and uh, fewest turnovers, but more shot attempts than everybody, that, that's what functionally fast means. The, the second that that turnover number starts going up, we slow, we, we've got to slow things down and you know, like you said, everybody talks about it and everybody wants to play fast, but man, uh, talking about it and doing it's two completely different things. And for us, it is getting a, a quick shot uh, without turning it over by the right people in the right spot. So we are functioning. We're not turning it over. We're getting it to our top scorers in an area that, that they're uh, able to be creative and, and be successful scorers. Um, you know, it's it, it was I was a big fan of Paul Westhead, and but not his system. I, I didn't like the full system. And he and I have talked about this many, many times, and we have great arguments. <laughs> I, I wanted to play that fast, but I didn't want it to risk turnovers. And I didn't want it to end up being in the wrong player's hands sometimes. So um, just after 14 years of being an assistant, getting the ball and putting pressure onto the defense as, as quickly as we could, uh, but yet still play a brand that people want to watch. Nobody wants to see turnovers. and mm -hmm. Nobody wants to come to the game and have to have their hands ready for a pass, you know, in the stands. They want to mm -hmm. see players passing the players. So that's where functionally fast came from, and it's just kind of stuck. And um, I, I do think it speaks to an image of how we want to play. I'm going to come back to the turnovers in just a few moments, but okay. keeping it on kind of like the, again, bigger picture here. We all know that it starts with how you practice. What does a fast practice look like? Well, it starts with the, with expecting the players to already be loose. There's no warm-up period for us because there's always a pregame. Well, that's mm -hmm. that's when my athletic trainers and the players themselves, when, when I walk into the gym and blow the whistle, and we're going full-court transition for at least the first 15 minutes of every practice. I want them to know that's the way we expect them to come out of a locker room. So that's where we start every practice. And it's it's game shots at game speeds from game spots. Uh, and on a good day, that first 15 minutes, we can get anywhere from 500 to 750 shots up as a team. Uh, everything is in the full court. We're sprinting back to transition defense. We try to practice the things we do a lot. You know, the, the, the things that we get 70% of the time in games, we spend 70% of our practice time on. The things that we get, 30% of the times in the game, we practice 30% of our practice time with. So um, the kids, to the kids, it means there's no wasted drills. We're not doing, you know, star drill and two line layups to get loose. That's, we are coming in when you check, when, when that buzzer goes off and we're done, they know that it's time to play. Hmm. And that's what you got to be in a game. So we try to simulate those things. And, uh, you know, if you come to our practice, I, I wouldn't tell you that they're, um, you know, they're probably not your textbook, what people say a good practice looks like, and that's okay with me. It's good for us. Um, there's a lot of downtime. There's a lot of walking between drills. There's walking to the water cooler. There's, you know, I'm not one of those guys you got to sprint everywhere. But when we go, we go. And that's where I want that line to be drawn with our kids. It's, it's okay to walk slow to the water cooler. But when we get in the drill, there is no walking. There is no time to be slow. 
Um, and that, that permeates throughout the years. The seniors sell the juniors and the freshmen and the sophomores. And, and it just – you look up and you're an hour and 25 minutes into it and you're too tired. You can't go more than an hour and 25 because we've practiced fast. Shameless plug for your YouTube channel. Yeah. And then the – if you would say, go and look at these two or three drills for what I just described, what would they be? Quick strike. It's a drill that we uh, slowly developed over the years. A couple of our players at Washington came up with the idea, uh, and we've just been tweaking it ever since. Um, I would go to our YouTube channel. Pauline Love uh, does a tremendous job. She started that for us. I don't even know how many. It's got millions and millions of views. Uh, people have wanted to, you know, monetize it. And I said, no, this is free. Uh, this is, this is what basketball is supposed to be about. So she gets me about once every month and we shoot a drill and put it up there. But I would, I would go to quick strike first and foremost, and then I would go back and do our baseball shooting drills. Those are how you practice to play in the quick strikes. But, um, those two would be the, the two I would go through and then let that wormhole you, you know, after you get on the site, let that worm hold you down and through the rest of the pieces that, that she does such a good job putting together. And uh, Coach Schaefer gets on there and shares some of our individual one-on-one -on -one breakdowns that we do for individual players to be successful within the system. Um, and, and I just hope after you watch the full thing, what you hear is, you know, a consistent language. Uh, you don't hear Coach Schaefer saying a different term than I do. You don't hear Coach Love using a different term than I do. And you'll be seeing my new assistant, Lacey Goldwire, on there as well. We we all have the same language. We use the same um, words to describe, and we're very intentional in the use of the words that we use. Um, you don't usually hear numbers. We don't number our players one, two, three, four, and five. You'll hear rackers, rabbits, locks, and dragons. And to that, you may need to go to the video that explains that. But uh, hopefully what you can do on that YouTube channel is spend 45 minutes to an hour and get a, a very, very quick snapshot of, of how everything that we do blends together. Can you explain, you brought them up, the different positions for somebody that doesn't know and maybe like a one or two sentence of what those players' jobs are? Yeah, sure. Uh, it evolved out of the fact that for years, you know, you hear positionless basketball and yet they still write down one, two, three, four, five <laughs> on their diagrams. Or they'll say point guard, two guard, three guard. I just want – we have a different level of expectations for each of our positions. So by – when. When I get a recruit and they say, well, you know, where do you see me fit in your system? I'm a two. No, no, no. For us, you're a lock. And they go, oh, well, what's a lock? I get to explain to them in specific behaviors and details what we expect out of our locks. Our locks are probably what most people refer to as your two and your three, your wing players, maybe a shooting guard and, a, and an athletic slashing guard. That's who our locks become. Uh, our rabbit is our fastest player on the floor that is the key to all of our transition. Uh, she runs out uh, ahead of everybody. She runs at the rim. She runs to hide in holes. That's where the – when you give these kids these names, they start finding all these – we've got rabbit holes. <laughs> got rabbit ears. And you've got all these different terms that they come up. The dragon is the one everybody wants to uh, be. Uh, but mainly because it just sounds like it's like games of Thrones, like badass <laughs> sound, you know, you're a dragon, you know, they want that spot, but mainly is because you get to be the last person to cross half court. Uh, you come down, you bang that trail three that, you know, Talia Walton started it for us back at Washington during uh, the final four run. And, you know, then it became Chelsea Dungey here. And so the, uh, the tryout list, uh, the application file for our dragon, <laughs> job is usually pretty thick um but it, it's very demanding and then our racker uh, we want that player to immediately think every time i get the ball I, i'm taking it to the rack and i'm going to make good decisions with what to do with it once i do do i do i finish do i do i hit my dragon do i hit a lot do i drop it to the rabbit um you know that's where the names came from and how they've evolved is just each player that assumes those roles they make it kind of their own identity and they come up with cool ways to relate it back to that. Uh, I love to talk to people who have adopted the idea, but change the terminology. Uh, we have a, a local high school team here that they they've named all their positions after top gun names. So they have goose and Maverick and slider and Iceman. Uh, I've got another group that uses, uh, you know, the animal kingdom and another one uses military terms. They have a sniper 
and a lookout and a scout. So I think that gives it, it makes it your own. And I think that's what we all have to do as coaches. This, this doesn't work for everybody unless you take it and make it your own. If you are running these things, you have to make it your own to fit your own personnel. And then it has to be adaptive over the years. So that's how it came about. That's how it's evolved. And it'll be ever-changing. You know, we graduated some players that uh, are hard to – there's not players like them. They're, we have a different set of talent. So the names won't change, but maybe some of the duties will, ex- will, will change. So hopefully that gives you that one word, one sentence answer uh, and, and a, a background as to not only that, but the why we do it is so that our players – have an ownership in their their individual position, and then we as a team, we know that if we hear somebody else doing it, it, it it's they heard it from us, you know. It, it, and the kids get a sense of pride in that, and they love not being referred to as a two, three, or a four, uh, because I guarantee you, if we if we got together your last ten people that were on a podcast with you and asked to write down what a the top three things you need in a point guard, there'd probably be a pretty wide range of. Uh, behaviors that we all look for in that position. That's not the case for us. It's very, very specific. It's very, very spelled out. Um, They certainly take it and put their own stamp on it, but uh, it allows us to have a a really, really clear identity. I think it helps in the the obvious uh, importance of role development. It takes it one step further that you've got to now take on this uh, kind of a personification uh, of the name of the position you're playing. We are at a part of the year right now where you probably have new players that are coming in, obviously older players who have been there, but now maybe taking the next step up. When you work with them during these these workouts and maybe have some bigger team sessions too, my first question is to teach this, do you go whole part whole or do you use the individual workouts as a way to build up to that hole and they don't even know that they're a part of the system? Yeah, they don't know. It, it is all together. We, we take five shots every trip we run down. Uh, and we can change what that each individual person does. So I, I think it's obvi- – honestly, it is whole part whole, but it's whole together. Mm-hmm. It's doing the parts at the same time wholly together. Because mm-hmm. I want them to understand the importance of spacing. Uh, and win in your race, you know, we've, we've called it race and space because we want our players to win their, their foot race to the space on the floor that their position is supposed to occupy. So I, I don't think you can get a clear picture of that. It's obviously very easy to break down to the part if you do have a player come in for a one-on-one. But as far as teaching goes, and we tell our players, learn one position, learn one name, be, a, be the best lock you can be before you start trying to be another position. That obviously also goes with our philosophy that we don't let the parts be interchangeable within transition. Like the rabbit, the rabbit never changes to the dragon based on who gets the rebound. Your role is your role. So it eliminates, I I say this all the time, it eliminates all the what ifs. I I don't have a, a, a player can't come to me and go, yeah, coach, well, I thought that I was supposed to do this because she got the rebound. No, 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 no. It's very, very – There's like the accountability to this is you – Gino Ariema said this in a podcast a couple – during the during the COVID, and it, it's been probably the most borrowed, stolen, shared things, but I, I obviously want to reference it back to him. He said that once you've taught kids to do things and you've told them your expectation and you've shared that with them and you've practiced it, if they don't do it from that point, there's only one of two reasons – They can't or they don't want to. Mm -hmm. And neither one of those are good. Mm -hmm. So once we've got this laid out and we, your job is to every time we get possession of the ball, run as fast as you can to your rabbit hole. All I got to do on film is stop and look at her and go, can't or won't. Mm -hmm. And she'll go, won't. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because nobody wants to say they can't Mm -hmm. ever. So the accountability is, it's not all the – there's no what ifs. There's no I thoughts. There's no, well, the rebound went over there, so I thought I was supposed to take the lock. No, 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 no. You are the rabbit. You are the dragon. Do what those players do. Mm-hmm. So we teach you to learn all those things before you start branching off and trying to be somebody else. Um, obviously, the more uh, places you can learn, the more value you have because in our system, again, I want to be able to play our best five players. If we need a sub – 
I want to be able to sub our sixth best player in, not the next best player that happens to be a rabbit. Mm -hmm. So I want all these players, and that's where the seniors, it's classic this time of the year because my upperclassmen now know it, and you hear them talking to the freshmen, and they're like, come on, man, you should know to do that. And I look at them, I go, hey, you want to remind you what you were doing when you were a freshman? Or do you want me, you want to tell them or you want me, or do you want to knock off that condescending tone you got? Because you are the exact, and they're, oh, yeah, coach, I got it, I got it, I got it. it." Can't or won't. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So let me ask this now, and I don't want to get into it per se, but a lot of times coaches will compartmentalize, this is my transition offense. Now this is my half-court offense, transition defense, half-court defense. Okay. So for you, because a coach may listen to this, and I don't want to get them – I don't want them getting the wrong impression. Like, all right, we're going to pick this up, and then once this doesn't work – we're going to go into and run our half court offense. I I know this is like a, this is an all day session question that I'm about to ask you, but can you just explain kind of how this fits? You say, cause you're trying to be nice and explaining it to people. This is yeah. our transition offense. And then we run off a half court offense, yeah. but really you just run offense. Correct. So yeah. can you, can you kind of like describe how this sure. fits in with your, because I, I, I want a coach to be able to take this because I firmly believe it is most effective when this just seamlessly transitions, you're playing, you're playing race and space offense for the entire 30, 35, whatever your shot clock is. This isn't the first eight seconds. And then we run our half court. No, it, it is. It, it does trigger a net, another set of reads. So I, I'm glad you asked that question. You've obviously looked at it and studied it because the way you framed the question. Um, the way our things are broken down is, and, and I'm not I'm not talking about any other offense being better or worse or different. It's, this is just the way I learned. I was a pretty good point guard, I thought, but I couldn't read three things at one time. I really couldn't, and I thought I was pretty good. I could read one thing really good. So I want our players to think, and we call them triads, one, two, threes. I want to read this, and if it's not that, then this, and if it's not that, then this. And if I get all the way through that triad, then we have what's next. This is my homage to West Wing and President Bartlett when he'd always say, okay, what's next? Because when we get to what's next, that's what I mean. Those three things didn't work. This is your next thing. So when we go down in our race and space and everybody goes through their one, two, and three, okay, that just triggers the next triad which is all based on what my racker does. She can dribble handoff with the corner place. She can swing the ball back through. She can, there's a number of things she can do, but it doesn't require her stopping, looking at me, calling out a hand signal, relaying that to our players, and then trying to execute. Mm-hmm. It is all based on where the ball goes. Mm-hmm. And that becomes a repetition thing and a teaching point. But it's all one, two, three, what's next? One, two, three, what's next? One, two, three. And now the shot clock is getting down to where we might have to run a set action at the end of a play. But in a live ball, this came from, I'm not sure which book. I'll have to, I'll find the book and and send it to you. But I was reading a book about focus. And it was a study done uh, with some of the greatest athletes in the world. And they found that if you break the concentration of the greatest athletes in the world, it takes them between three and five seconds to refocus. Okay. That didn't scare me. I don't have the greatest athletes in the world. So I only, only get them very rarely. Okay. <laughs> I'm dealing with a couple of runs down left. And I understand that I was that player. If you break my focus during a live ball, it can take up to three minutes. And the worst focused people can take up to 21 minutes. So if you've got a kid that you know is unfocused and you start yelling at them something during a live ball, do not expect them to be able to execute it. Hmm. So rather than fight biology, (laughs) I decided to shut my mouth during a live ball and work in practice when we have time to refocus. Hmm. And then in a game, let the game happen. Do not overcoach live balls. Don't start trying. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to see me in a game stand up and yell actions because the ball has stopped. If the action stops, if there's a long ball that's kicked out of bounds or near out of bounds and we don't get – I might call a set play. If 
Fitz throw. We might call a set action because that dead ball in between the time the free throw shuts where our focus gets. So that's a pretty long answer to your question, but I hope it explains the why part of it. The how is you just got to practice it in practice, mm -hmm. but don't do it during a game. You know, people say a lot, of, you don't say much during a game. I take that as a compliment because I don't think I should be saying much, especially during live balls. And I would assume that practicing it during practice means a lot of three on three, four on four, five on five from a start position, not just go out and play full court for five minutes. No, that's right. And, you know, you know, I, I realize that uh, we're fortunate with technology, but I tell people this all the time. I don't care if you have a, a million dollar budget or a hundred dollar budget. Most of us have a cell phone. OK, most of us have an iPhone 11 or 12. It doesn't matter whether you're making two million dollars a year or twenty thousand dollars a year. We all pretty much have the same phone. You can do this all on your phone. You can record little bits of practices and stop them when it happens. Don't teach during the live ball. Teach that moment. You are losing all of your credibility if you wait till the next day to show it in the film room. Mm -hmm. You've lost them. They've got about a seven second memory span. So we, we've got a board over in our room, in our gym, that we can run right to that board and say, oh, you thought you were running hard? Well, let's go look at that. Mm -hmm. So immediate, when it comes to these decision-making things and in practice, that's when you do that. Don't, mm -hmm. don't try to solve cancer. Don't, I always say it all the time. Don't cure cancer during a game. Mm -hmm. Do that in practice. Mm -hmm. You cure cancer in the lab. You don't cure cancer on the operating table. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yes, we, we practice under chaos. I want there to be mass chaos and shooting drills. I want there to be bells and whistles. I don't ever, you'll very rarely, I think in 20, I've been a head coach now eight years. So that's about 800 practices. I can remember say, hold the balls one time. When I was a high school coach, I said it 900 times a, a week. Hey, hold the balls. Cause I thought you had to have this quiet, pristine and listen to me i'm the leader i say hold the balls thou shalt hold the balls and they do because i'm the coach if, if a ball is distracting me now that's on me that's mm -hmm. on them i want there to be as much chaos we practice with music during times when we do our shooting drills there's balls going all over the gym we may not wrote but we get to where we can stay calm in chaotic situations that's a friend for shilla Practice chaos equals game calmness. Mm -hmm. uh, and we try to emulate that as much as we can. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there are a ton of, I'll even link them in below, a couple courses, free courses online. I know one you did over the pandemic. So there are probably questions that I didn't answer that people are going to wonder about. Well, I just watched I just watched the video, so I have the advantage. So I, yeah. maybe some of these I'm not asking, but a couple couple things probably that people are wondering about. So I'll, I'll be sure to link that below. Yeah, and, and tell them to put my email address on there as well. It's coach neighbors at uark.edu. Um, give me a couple of weeks to respond to them. I get between 500 and a thousand a week and I try to get back to all of them. I've got a great staff that helps me with that, but I try to personally respond to as many as I can. Uh, and we've got all of this stuff on video. We've got all of it written out. Um, championship videos did, finally talked me into putting some videos out. I hate even <laughs> telling you I get 39 cents a copy from that. So <laughs> I will free, I will share for free. Uh, I, I want free guys that people shared with me. So, uh, but I know people collect championship videos and like to have them, but I uh, will be happy to share you with almost anything that we have. All right. I have a couple like coach ask questions and Go. these are a little kind of all over the place. Yep. The first one I have that everybody always asks, I, I've heard people have asked you this before, but your goals percentage wise for field goal turnovers and anything else maybe that matters, but I know those two in particular. Yeah. We, and we, we use percentages. We don't use raw numbers because of the pace. Uh, we, we, for us to be successful, we have to be below 12%, more in that 10 to 11 range on turnovers. So uh, 10 turnovers for every hundred possessions is kind of when we're playing at our best. There's not really a raw number, uh, with, sh but I want our team to always have more free throw and field goal attempts combined than our opponents. And and if that number, the, the bigger the number, the better chance we have to win. Uh, that allows us to, to make up for the deficiencies that we have in rebounding. And the fact that we don't turn it over 
obviously affects that number. Mm-hmm. Um, I want my best player, my, 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 my three green light shooters to take 75% of our shots. And I want our red light, sh- our yellow light shooters to take the next 20 and our red light shooters to shoot five. Uh, and we, that's another whole day, and that's another whole week of talking about how we determine who those players are. But if my if my best shooters, my best scorers, aren't getting the most shots, <coughs> that's on me. Mm-hmm. <coughs> that's on us as a staff. So I, those are the numbers I look at <coughs> for us to beat the best teams. You know, the day that we beat UConn this year, we shot fifty five percent. There's only been three teams in the last twenty one years shoot over 50% against those guys. So to have that as a goal would have been a problem. <clears throat> I just want to shoot more shots. But when we make shots, we we can literally – that's what gives us that puncher's chance, and that's why we play the way we do. Mm-hmm. On the flip side of that, we can have a cold day and be that 413 upset in the NCAA tournament like we were. Mm-hmm. That happens. Um, we have remedied that issue this summer with uh, recruiting. And now we've got six five six 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 three six 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 three in here. Uh, our rebounding is going to improve, and I, I think we can take that uh, <clears throat> take that punch away from some of our opponents. I think it's important to note because when people hear race in space, for some reason they immediately associate that with just shooting a bunch of threes. But that's actually the opposite of what Coach Neighbors does. So just threes so that we're clear, right? Yeah. Threes threes are way down the list. It you know there's a reason Kelsey Plum broke the NCAA all-time three uh, free throw record. Uh, there's a reason Chelsea Dungey for three straight years led all the Power Five for free throw attempts, and we as a team did uh, the Power Five teams. Getting to the foul line is what it's all about for us. That puts pressure on the defense. You would you can win a bar bet every year if you bet who has the most points in the paint, and they always – they would never – it's usually us. We've been number one or number two in the SEC the last four years. South Carolina, when they had Asia Wilson and Elena Coates, knocked us off that year. But we get a lot of paint points because we do drive it, half-court layups, and we get to the foul line. So the threes are, are what gets all the, the attention, but that's the, that's the third bucket uh, on our list for sure. Uh, let me go back to the turnovers. <laughs> when your team does have turnovers, you mentioned at the beginning, is it j- just too fast? Or is there is there something behind? Do you feel like it's decision made? Like, wh- what is the primary cause of that? I think there's this idea that all turnovers are created equal. Like, no, we're just not, making. You know, yeah. for us, we have a few that we're okay with. I'm okay with some charges. You know, as long as you're charging into your own player. Hmm. Okay, we we do not like it when you charge into a help defender. That's a bad thing. That means you made the wrong decision. You should have probably passed it at that point. If you charge into your own player, the player that's guarding you, I don't have too, pro- too much of a problem with that one because you're being aggressive. Uh, our, our turnovers, when they lead to a loss, every time have been something uncharacteristic. A, uh, a Something that we've done. Now, there have been teams that have forced it. They just get up and take it from us. But that's on us to be better ball handlers. Mm-hmm. There has not been a team. Mississippi State did it to us our first year, and, and Coach Schaefer is as good a pressure defensive coach as there is. But for us, when the turnovers mount, it's usually because we're either trying to be too unselfish or too selfish. It's one of those two things. We either turn down an open shot, and I, and I understand that because we shoot it so fast, we don't have as many opportunities to turn it over. I get that. <coughs> but we, we have eliminated traveling – almost exclusively because we use permanent foot pivot foots and mm. we work on that. So you don't see that shuffle step out of our guys. We eliminate that. Uh, there's certain times in certain places we don't make passes in transition. Uh, we've got rules like you can't fake a backdoor cut. If you go back door, you got to go. That saves us one every couple of games. <clears throat> Another small thing is we don't try to score on inbounds plays underneath the basket unless it's a time and score situation. Uh, That one always prompts them. So we'll talk just briefly about it. But my whole theory is we're trying to score against you four on five Hmm. on an inbounds play. Because my kid throwing it in, can't. she's not going to be a threat until it becomes five on five. Mm -hmm. So if I'm good enough to draw up a play to score four on five, 
then I probably shouldn't worry about it because we're going to beat you anyway. Mm. So I want to get the ball in safely and run what we do half court because five on five, I've got a better chance that we're a man down. Mm-hmm. So we don't, we don't very rarely turn it over on inbounds plays because the majority of the time it's a fresh shot clock and we're just trying to get it in to run something we do in the half court. So I think what you should do as a coach is go back to games, maybe last year's games and look where your turnovers occur and see how many of those you can eliminate <clears throat> by putting some, some standards into play to, to not make those types of turnovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, completely unrelated, but as teams, especially the lower levels you go zone press or just zone you. Yeah. Does that adjust anything that we just talked about? <clears throat> yeah. We're going to beat you worse. <laughs> um, we saw, we had one game last year in which a team played um, <clears throat> the majority zone. We had 19 threes. It's a team that I think, um, you know, if they'd have played this man, I think it could have been a two point game. I really do. But they didn't, and it just – so your zone offense has to be good to, to keep people from just doing exactly what you said. Mm-hmm. Some people say that to us, all, well, we're just going to press you. Okay, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> oh, we're just going to deny it to your racker. Okay, well, give that a shot, and we'll, we'll see how that works. Because <clears throat> you've not been – they've not simulated how fast Chelsea Dunn's you get the ball in out of the net. Mm-hmm. I don't care how good their men's practice team was in practice, they weren't able to simulate that. Mm-hmm. So – it, it has slowed us down. Uh, Syracuse slowed us down in the final four with it. And I would tell you probably beat us, but I, I think they could have beaten us a lot of different ways. He, he had a really, really good team. Um, my kids' eyes light up when they hear zone because when, when we see a zone, we now get to determine matchups. Hmm. When you're playing us man to man, you've determined the matchups. But when you put a zone defense out there, now me and our staff can put our players on your players however we want to, and your players are going to be guarding the right – your wrong player is going to be guarding our right player. Hmm. So we, we find the weak antelope. We try to cut the, that person out, and, and we go at them. So when you're in man, we don't have time to do that, and there's so many things you can do. But in zone, we get to determine the matchups. Um, so we've got, to, we've got to be very effective in our zone. Uh, so if they do go to that just to not have to deal with us in man, that means we're going to shoot threes, and we we very rarely turn it over against zones. Like, mm-hmm. we average four or five turnovers a game against mm-hmm. the zone defense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's hard to beat. Hard to uh, beat. La- yeah, last thing here, finish this sentence. For coaches who, again, they, they want to play fast, if your team is going to be great at playing fast, you have to what? Have some job security. <laughs> I, I'm serious. You really do. You, you, cause you're going to lose a game or two that you're not supposed to. Hmm. You are, it's going to happen. And there's going to be nights. It looks, and it's so easy for Monday morning quarterback or internet, uh, guru, uh, you know, out there talking about you with no repercussions to point out that you played too fast or you turned it over or you didn't get the right shots. Hmm. <clears throat> But that is that is a very good trade-off to be able to beat UConn, to be able to beat Baylor, to be able to win against South Carolina in the SEC tournament a few years ago. Yes, they've beaten us more than they beat than we beat them. But we've got a puncher's chance every night. Mm-hmm. And it's the only way for us to win. Okay. We we have not, until just recently, been able to attract the the very, very rare big player. There's a bunch of 5'11 to 6 foot kids to 5'8 kids walking around that can shoot it. So we bought into having a puncher's mentality, a slugger's chance, and I feel like I've got enough job security that we can withstand a loss or two or a bad performance because they know down the line that's going to equal to a big win in the SEC or a big win over a non-conference opponent because you play that way all the time. Mm-hmm. We have a change-up. You know, we have a, we have, that's a definitely our fastball and we have some change ups, but man, if you can't, if you can't get your fastball over the plate, you're never going to be a good pitcher. And I think that's the same thing in, in basketball. Yeah. You've got to have something that everybody knows you're, you're about and have to stop that first and foremost, every time. Yeah. That's coach, coach Mike neighbors of the university of Arkansas coach. Thanks for taking time to talk today. Yeah, you bet. Of course.